All right, chapter nine, Apes chapter nine, lecture two. Uh, we're starting where we left off from our last lecture. So we're talking about soil in our last chapter. So now we're going to talk about agriculture and how agriculture gets the water that it is needed. This is how we're going to begin the section. So irrigation, um, you need to water plants. Uh, remember the equation, H2O plus CO2 will yield uh, C6H1206 and oxygen. So water is a limiting factor. You need water to grow your food. Um, basically, certain crops use more water than others. Rice is one of those, for example, that uses a lot of water. All right. Um, also, people who grow crops in drier climates, it requires more water because of uh, the high rate of evaporation. So about 70% of our fresh water goes into – our fresh water use goes into irrigation. All right. Water logging, this term, this term relates to uh, overwatering. When, when you overwater uh, a plant or soil, the, there's so much water there that the, the roots suffocate, basically. They lose their ability to get to oxygen. So, you know, your plant, uh, those roots, they, they need oxygen in an aerobic environment. They don't want to be uh, constantly overloaded with too much water. It'll suffocate them. So their oxygen, they can't get the oxygen they needed to do their respiration. And that's what will kill the plant. Salization is a buildup of salts that uh, show up on the surface of the soil layers. Well, how do they get there? Well, water, in case you don't, re in case you remember back in an earlier chapter, water can stick to itself and stick to other other things. This is called the cohesion and adhesion of water. Well, water um, gets pulled off the uh, surface of the earth through evaporation, and as it gets pulled off the surface of the soil through evaporation. It is sticking to the water that is below it and then pulling that layer up. Well, if you keep evaporating a lot of water from the surface, you will keep pulling up water from below, and the water as it comes up will bring salts with it and different minerals with it. So basically, drier climates where you have a lot of evaporation, arid and semi-arid, you're going to have generally areas like that are going to have a problem with salinization over time. The more water they use, the more evaporates, the more salt gets pulled up. It's a positive feedback loop, basically. Um, what do they do to remedy this? They flush the land with salt water. Well, excuse me, with non-salty water, less saline water. But even that water will evaporate and bring up more salts with it over time. So it's a, it's a positive feedback loop. It's kind of hard to deal with. Ideally, in those climates, they should be planting salt-tolerant um, harvests that don't need you know they can handle those kinds of that you know, water that has salt in it a little bit and the problem is, is in these areas uh, a lot of farmers are paid what's called subsidies we'll talk about in a little bit to grow certain things and those certain things may not necessarily be good for the environment so what can we do to be sustainable well Conventional irrigation, here's a picture showing you this. Um, conventional irrigation is, is basically water going in every direction. It's not as efficient. Drip irrigation is, this is a showing you drip irrigation. You can have, even have drip irrigation below ground just going straight to the roots. Much more efficient. It uses about half the water as conventional irrigation. Okay. Um, basically, a lot of what's used for irrigation, a lot of what's goes using irrigation, especially with conventional irrigation, is go, ends up as runoff, okay, with through conventional irrigation, a lot of it gets evaporated, all right? Government subsidies, well, what, are the, what does the government do? They give people money to grow things in dry climates that wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily be the best thing to do there. Yeah. All right, nutrients, so what do we do to plants? What do we give them? We give them different kinds of fertilizers. Inorganic fertilizers are high in mineral content, okay? Inorganic fertilizers are breaking down all these living things and they're breaking down, you know, their parts as they break down go into the soil. Okay, so this is organic fertilizer. This is inorganic fertilizer. Which one is usually worse for the environment? Inorganic fertilizer. Well, why? Because you these nutrients quickly leach out, all right? And then they end up becoming an environmental problem. They end up in runoff and they end up washing up somewhere else. Organic fertilizers a lot of times are wastes basically and they start breaking down. People use compost. What they do is they'll save food scraps. They'll – basically even some restaurants have this. They'll have a, a trash container, a recycling container, and a compost container. And that compost is where you would save food parts, not bones. 
those don't do very well in a pile. Um, you wouldn't want you can put plant pieces of plants, but you don't want to put weeds in there because then you're going to have weeds growing where you want your garden growing. But a lot of people will save um, fruits and vegetables and different different types of uh, different types of manure can be used. Different types of uh, waste products can be used to produce this compost material, basically. And then what it does is it starts to break down, and then pretty much you're giving your plants some organic fertilizer. Now, this goes back to a couple chapters ago. Well, look, nitrogen and phosphorus runoff, all right? So we're talking about fertilizer, which is high in nitrates and phosphates, different nitrogen compounds and phosphorus compounds. What does this lead to? Eutrophication, oxygen-depleted dead zones in the, in the, in the water. Also, some of these chemicals, like these nitrogen-based chemicals, these nitrates, they can volatize. They can evaporate. And nitrogen-based compounds form nitrogen oxides, which form um, nitric acid, which can become acid rain, for example. Or it, some of these nitrogen compounds could um, combine with other things, creating smog. All right? um, nitrates are also linked to cancers, in case you didn't know. Nitrates are a preservative um, connected to sodium, sodium nitrates in a lot of our foods, even sodium nitrites, uh, specifically in what's called cured food or cured meat. Cured meat was uh, labeled as being uh, a cancer causer. And what is it in cured meat that is the cancer causer? It is the sodium nitrates that are in it that is the cancer causer. Right? Precision agriculture. Well, let's talk about trying to do farming in a more sustainable fashion. And what does precision agriculture do? It means you monitor things really closely. Soil levels, water levels. They use drones with sensors on them. Constant communication back and forth. And then all of a sudden you got a farmer somewhere going, oh, I guess we need to irrigate. So everything's done with monitoring. All right. Why is this good? Because um, they embrace organic fertilizer use. They are trying to do things sustainably. They're not. They're trying to reduce the amount of runoff that that over occurs. They're trying to reduce the over application of certain of certain anything. They just don't want to overuse things because that's what ends up in the environment causing its destruction. Pollinators. These guys have come up a lot. Um, there's different ways of being pollinated. Uh, this dandelion here is wind pollination, and this one here is is a pollination with uh, the help of a friend. This is a mutualistic pollination. So you got the animal pollinators and you got the wind pollinators. Wind pollinators, you've probably noticed a lot of you start sneezing in the springtime. You can even sometimes see the pollen flying in the air if it's really windy. And dandelion is just one example of a, of a species that, that re, re, you know relies on wind pollination. Grain crops, all right, so the crops that rely on pollinators, grain crops, wheat and corn, all right, not only just that, fruits and vegetables and nuts, um, bees do most of the work. Flies are involved. Beetles are involved. Wasps, butterflies, moths, they're all involved, but mainly the bees. Um, the, showing you here, it's the bees are extremely, extremely essential. Being a beekeeper is actually could be a lucrative financial job for a lot of people, all right? What's happening to the bees? That's this next thing. Well, they're getting killed by pesticides. The pesticides aren't designed to kill them. They're designed to remove other pests from, these, from the agricultural crop. The problem is the bees are needed to help uh, create the fruits and the vegetables and all the crops that we need. We need their pollination to help create those. So in the process of doing that, these bees get poisoned by the pesticides that are around. They also get poisoned by the pesticides that people use around their houses. Um, a lot of times they take these pesticides back to their hive and, and, the, and a lot of others die as a result of it. So the big killer of the bees currently is specific pe pesticides. They're called the neonicotinoamide, I believe, type of pesticides that are doing it to them. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about land degradation. Well, everything... To preserve soil, the big thing here is you got to reduce um, erosion. Okay, increasing erosion, land degradation. Soil is very important. All right. So anything that we do that that reduces productivity um, and reduces biodiversity, and basically that is land degradation. All right. And generally, it leads to a lot of erosion, no nutrients, water scarcity, and pollution at all levels. All right. Um, Basically, when we talk about soil de degradation, we're talking about the quality all right, of the soil changing also. 
overgrazing is a big problem when you allow animals just to trample all over it and eat everything down to nothing and continue to trample over it. They start compacting the soil and they create a lot of problems when you overgraze. Erosion is a big problem. Okay, so things get removed from one place and transported to another, wind and water. This is called real erosion over here. I've seen AP questions about this for some reason a bunch. Real erosion occurs when water kind of creates these little gullies. All right, these, the, basically water running through an area creates these gullies. This is real erosion. All right, it's not very good for the soil. All right. Dep deposition means, all right, well, when something gets eroded, it gets dropped off somewhere else, all right? So we know that erosion and deposition, they're natural processes. Uh, they happen all the time. Rivers carry minerals and sediments. They deposit them in a floodplain, and that is why floodplains are very, very fertile soils because the things that get eroded and deposited are carrying minerals and nutrients with them, all right? Um, areas that are hillsides, sloped, a lot of wind, a lot of moisture, a lot of precipitation. These are areas that are high risk of erosion. A lot of people plant ice plants on their hillsides near their house so that the roots can anchor the soil. So having vegetation present will anchor the soil and prevent erosion. If you have a hillside and you cut all the plants down and you cut all the trees down, you will no longer have those roots anchoring that hillside down. And now the hillside is much more prone to erosion. So plants themselves are the anchors. Their roots anchor the soil in place. So what do we do? How do we make land more vulnerable to erosion? Well, we over cultivate. Okay. We do excessive tilling and plowing, which means we are turning the soil and trying to loosen it up. Well, as we loosen it up, now wind can get a hold of it or water can get a hold of it and move it somewhere else. Um, we overgraze and we leave the ground barren of plants, plant of, you know, of anything growing there. And then now it's more likely to erode. We clear forests, um, especially on, sleep, on steep slopes, to start growing crops. And when we do that, erosion. Okay. Um, desertification. This occurs when an area becomes more desert-like. Okay. Meaning what's happened in dry areas, in dry areas, you have a lot of erosion. Okay. And you start trying to grow crops and you get salinization. Okay. And you get land degradation. So when you lose more than 10% of the area, it becomes desertified. It becomes des desertification is taking place. Areas that are most prone, drier climates are most prone to this, all right? The cause is wind and water erosion. It just keeps moving soil away from where you want it. The Dust Bowl, well, the late 19th and early 20th century, what happened? Well, they started moving out west. People started moving out west, and there was a lot of overgrazing. Um, a severe drought took place. Um, what happened was is there wasn't, you know, there wasn't a lot of rain, the, the area got extremely dry, and they lost a lot, about four inches of topsoil in a few years, which is awful. All right? It forced farmers to leave the area. This shows where it happened. Okay, Crop rotation. So what should farmers do with their crops? This, these are ways of minimizing soil erosion. All right, One way to minimize soil erosion is for farmers to alternate the types of crops grown from season to season. Why is this important? Well, the ground stays covered all year with something growing on it, so the soil is anchored. A good idea would be to alternate seasons with a, a bean or a legume. You may remember back that they have a, mutual realist, a mutualistic relationship with these nitrogen-fixing bacteria. So if you grow a bean or legume in between growing seasons of what you're really trying to grow and make your money on, you'll put nitrogen back into the soil naturally and fertilize the soil naturally with those legumes that are growing with those mutualistic bacteria. And it helps, it helps farmers do things and grow crops sustainably. Here's another method of reducing erosion, contour farming. You can see in the picture here, basically what they do is they, they do these furrows are planted, all right, across hillsides. And what do they do? They prevent rills and gullies to form, real erosion. It slows down real erosion. So what you're doing is you're creating places for water to travel when you're trying to grow the crops, all right? And basically, you know, they serve as little dams preventing water from making these rills and gullies. Terracing. 
creating platforms on the side of a hill when you're doing, uh, a, you know, growing food in a hillside or a hill, a hilly region. Well, these staircases, they, they move water in certain ways. You're pretty much creating drainage for the most part so that it doesn't erode the hillside away because of all this water. So you have terracing here and contour farming. Specifically, this is farming done on hillsides. All right. So this is these are means of preventing uh, excess erosion. Intercropping. All right. So you have different kinds of crops being planted. All right. And once again, the whole goal is to reduce erosion. If you increase ground cover, you have more roots in the ground and you're preserving soil. The soil will stay in place. Right, so you some of these crops can be taller than others, and they can have they can prevent wind erosion. All right, and we already said legumes with their mutualistic bacteria, they can be used to restore nitrogen back in the soil. So if you do this correctly, you're going to fertilize the soil with the plants that you actually grow. Shelter belts, well, these are wind breaks. So you you're planting certain type of vegetation to block the wind, so you're less wind, less erosion. Conservation tillage. All right, so tilling turns the turns the soil over and loosens it up so for the next harvest, for the next season. Ideally, that re, that increases erosion because you're loosening up the soil when there's nothing growing on it. When there's nothing growing on it and you loosen up the soil, wind and water will get a hold of it and erosion will take place. So it, it, it's not a sustainable method if we constantly till, all right? Ideally, no-till farming is where you leave crop residue on top and this residue – pretty much serves as like an umbrella protecting protecting the the soil from erosion all right you can also grow some cover crops if needed to all right and we already talked about subsidies but we need to talk about it in a little more detail this is money granted from the government some of you will get a subsidy for your school we'll call it a, a grant for college and or you'll get subsidized loans for college which means the government will pay back your loans for you all right a lot of corporations get subsidies in the form of tax breaks a lot of us get subsidies in the form of tax breaks at our houses, okay? So subsidies is money granted by the government. A lot of times the farmers get direct payments to grow certain crops. The oil and fossil fuel industry gets a lot of tax breaks. And what does this do? It tax A lot of these subsidies that go into these corporations and go into the workforce lower the prices of goods. This is how farmers can sell milk for fairly cheap and eggs for fairly cheap. It's What they do is basically the government is – putting money into their hands, they're selling it to us for cheaper. So the government, for the most part, is paying a percentage of, of a lot of the farming, um, a lot of the farming products in our country. All right, we'll stop there.